welcome. Welcome to this presentation. And um, Ben already started introducing me a little. Uh, indeed, I've done a fair bit of agroecological research. I've been um, mostly based in Indonesia, uh, working in forest, oil palm plantations, and rubber plantations. But um, I've also been introduced early to uh, ecoacoustic methods, and I've done a fair bit of uh, methodological work. And uh, since actually uh, the start of my postdoc in China, that's uh, that was one and a half years ago, I also started this project um, that Ben just talked about, uh, which which gave the impulse also for for the talk today. And today I'm actually, I mean, nowadays I'm I'm affiliated. Um, I'm based in Germany at the Technical University in Dresden at the Computational Landscape Ecology Lab of uh, Professor Anna Kort. And um, so I'd like to give you an overview of ecoacoustic patterns and research across the globe to try to answer this uh, very basic and fundamental question, what is the planet's acoustic makeup? Uh, luckily, I don't need to introduce too much about it because I'm, I'm assuming I'm preaching to the choir. And so we all know that uh, we're using similar methods, acoustic uh, methods to monitor environmental phenomena, um, mostly biodiversity, but also human impacts uh, on the environment. And so regarding uh, basics, what uh, unites us? Well, I'd like to just repeat the uh, the definition of, of what sound is to do to make the point that it's actually a very uh, a very wide and broad definition since sound is only is just a vibration that propagates through a medium it, it might be gas, it might be liquid or it might be a solid. And this is what we're taking advantage of to monitor all kinds of phenomena. So, when we actually uh, classify them by the frequency that they cover. Um, and uh, if we start with infrasound on the left here, um, actually, it's interesting to know that uh, even geological phenomena such as earthquakes um, can be monitored with those, those acoustic waves that travel through the earth mantle and crust. And so here's what you see as, a, as an old fashioned seismograph. But part of the infrasound frequency range is also used by marine mammals such as whales. Um, and here infrasound means that, of course, we, we cannot hear it, uh, even though some parts uh, are also within the audible frequency range, which is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. If you have very good hearing and, um, and, and if you're still young, maybe also. Um, Notable uh, representatives of the audible sound frequency range are the birds. And I'm sorry if your preferred taxon uh, is not on here on this slide. I couldn't list them all. But um, if we go then further to the right uh, into the ultrasound realm, you, you may also know that uh, this is a frequency range that is covered by bats who use this for echolocation and for hunting. And if we go even further to even higher frequencies in the ultrasound uh, domain, uh, we even use some of these um, these uh, wavelengths for imaging in, in medicine. So sound is a very general phenomenon and can be used to observe all kinds of things. And we also have a few concepts um, in common. I'm assuming that uh, there are people from a variety of, of disciplines and also biomes here today, I, I'm hoping. And we all we all talk of soundscapes. Um, but the interesting thing is that, yes, we have proposed definitions uh, for the terrestrial realm, for instance. Um, Brian Pijanowski has uh, has a proposed a definition that sounds different from uh, what we have in the International Organization for Standardization, standardization for aquatic um, realms, such as the, the marine realm. But actually, when you look closer, you, you would notice that those definitions of what a soundscape is are actually from the content pretty similar. And if I might uh, just try to, to say what a soundscape basically is, it would then be the collection of sounds that uh, are uh, that can be recorded, that can be found in a specific space and time. It's something very broad, but um, this is what we're building up on. 
And um, before I go more to the uh, eco-acoustic uh, side of things, I'd like to also stress, uh, since we're in the bioacoustics talks, that the history of eco-acoustics, and I would say that soundscape ecology is a synonym for it, uh, stems from the, the history of, of bioacoustics. And um, if you haven't already done so, you could head to this TED talk by uh, Bernie Krause, uh, who, who also was a musician first and who came uh, from, from, I would say, this different scene, maybe the, we could say the humanities and then into the bioacoustics and who is now a uh, famous uh, soundscape uh, expert. Um, I think it's it's quite worth uh, to hear uh, this one. It's a very interesting one. And uh, throughout the talk, you will see that the references are in this blue box at the bottom. I often like to make the point about um, about the technology, about the fact that uh, technological advances um, are advancing soundscape ecology. So, um, I think that throughout uh, the, 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 the history of this, of this research of soundscape ecology progress has been driven by uh, devices being able to sample ever higher sampling rates and thus be able to, um, to cover all of the vocalizations of different, different animals and also phenomena, and also by the decreasing size and cost and also the autonomy of these devices. What you can see here is a is a sound trap uh, deployed um, in the ocean uh, close to a, in, a, in a coral reef and um, it's a very very common device that everyone who's working in the ocean uh, knows and what you can see here on the right and i hope you can see my mouse um, is uh, is the audiomath strapped to a tree it's a device that was launched a few years ago and that basically revolutionized not only terrestrial um, soundscape ecology but probably will have a great impact also on the aquatic realms. And so we have, um, I'd like to show throughout uh, the talk that uh, these technological uh, details actually, how they, how they impact, how we do research in those different ecosystems as recorders, whether they're put into the water or strapped to a tree are defined by the sampling frequency, the number of channels and, and microphones that be, can be plugged into it. Um, into them and their power autonomy, which dictates how long they can be deployed in the field. And last but not least, the size and their price, which determines just how many we can put out and deploy in a landscape. So I'd like to start by giving an overview. Uh, these are just overviews. Those, those fields that I'm presenting are much, uh, much more vast uh, than what we're going to cover today. Um, this is an overview of the uh, freshwater ecoacoustic research. And so this has been reviewed uh, by um, Greenhall and uh, others. Um, and it very clearly emerged from this, uh, this review that, uh, again, historically, there has been a strong focus on bioacoustics, on uh, recording the vocalizations of uh, single fish species, um, many of them actually within in, in artificial conditions, and many of these species uh, were, that had a commercial interest, while the second most important taxon uh, to be studied in, in freshwater acoustic research uh, are the arthropods. But um, slowly with time, there is a shift from bio to ecoacoustics because this, the studies become more holistic and they, they focus so to say, well, it's not a focus anymore, because, but they go to the, to the soundscape level where not only single species are important. And um, I think that um, what we also observed was that there is also a shift from uh, opportunistic um, sampling. I, I don't mean in, it, uh, in, a, in a negative way. It's just that uh, first uh, freshwater recordings were also limited by, by technical uh, technical limitations and, and by the cost of also uh, all these hydrophones and, and recorders that you can deploy in the water. And more and more, we're seeing uh, studies with, uh, with replication, re replication in space and time, which has important implications for how we can synthesize these data. If you'd like to have a, um, to, to, to dip your ear into the water, I, I recommend this uh, video by John Akern here on, on YouTube, um, uh, where the, the screenshot comes from, and which shows you um, uh, some of the approaches uh, that you can have in this, um, in this discipline. And so um, since uh, freshwater ecoacoustic research is um, 
very much at an early stage, it happens that we also have, uh, that we often encounter unknown sounds underwater in freshwater systems. Uh, you can see here on the example of this study led by uh, Rodney Roundtree, uh, all these class unclassified sounds in the black uh, dashed box that had to be described as gurgles and, and bubble-like sounds. So it's striking and exciting at the same time that we that in this case for this study, around 11% of the sounds just, just aren't known. We just don't know what are what is emitting them. We don't even know what phony they come from. And here you see that for the first time I mentioned these phonies that were quickly mentioned in the definitions uh, in the terrestrial ones. Um, I will shortly explain again what they are. So this biophony, geophony, and anthropophony are um, uh, are concepts that we use to, to group the, the, the types of sounds that can be emitted in a soundscape. So the biophony would comprise all the acoustic biological activity, so basically mostly uh, soniferous animals. The geophony uh, would comprise all the geophysical uh, acoustic events, and the anthropophony would comprise all of the, um, the human uh, sounds, also the sounds made by machinery or or uh, structures built by humans. And so you can see how these um, these terms are used here and how other types of sounds are classified as biophony and anthropophony and the very large dominance of anthropophony. But more to that later. So when it comes to freshwater ecoacoustics, many sounds are not known and even um, cataloging the types of sounds that fishes uh, are, are making, uh, fish species are making, uh, we we just uh, we just well I say we uh, as if I did it but uh, colleagues just um, just recently got to a milestone as the fish sounds uh, database has been published it was version one I think last year and now they even got to version two this database and I encourage you to to um, to go into it and to listen to those sometimes weird sounds that a uh, fish can do is is collating uh, reference recordings from one thousand and ten fish species at the moment. So that's what I wanted to say about the uh, state of research in the freshwater. And now I'd like to go over to the oceans. And um, I, when talking about the oceans, I think it's, it was, uh, I, I remember how I discovered all uh, these things that, that are done in, in the salt water and how impressed I actually was um, that were, especially because of my background as a terrestrial ecologist, uh, would tell me, oh, we should do things like that properly. <laughs> so what struck me as, a, as an outsider of this field was um, how holistic uh, very often the approach is in the ocean. Very often the, the these phonies are used to categorize all sorts, all the sounds that can actually be recorded in a soundscape. And you can see that very well in this nice illustration here from uh, that paper by uh, Marina Duarte and, and, and colleagues, where all the types of sounds, uh, and they have different colors, but it's a bit hard to see, can be categorized into the biophony and the geophony and the anthropophony. And here they're also comparing pristine conditions or maybe even historic conditions, you could say, with uh, what we have nowadays in the Anthropocene, where much of the soundscape is dominated by um, anthropophony such as seismic surveys and military ship uh, sonars and all, all this all this uh, ship noise. And so um, this uh, to me is a distinct difference, this holistic approach compared to the, the research that is done on land, uh, but uh, more to that later. The other distinct um, uh, feature of, of uh, the research in the ocean is that uh, usually you, you don't just, you don't just uh, dump a cheap recorder in the water and, and forget about it. Um, it's so expensive, it's so so much effort, and uh, you need so many resources to be able to record sound in the ocean that uh, usually these devices are, and the vast majority of cases, these devices are calibrated, uh, meaning that the, uh, the readings we get from the, the, the recordings uh, are we know the sensitivity of the microphones that have been deployed, and we can actually derive um, sound level pressures, uh, sound pressure levels with absolute values, uh, which which then help us to actually quantify the noise levels in the oceans. And um, 
there is a very strong focus on uh, the impact of noise on all kinds of uh, organisms in the ocean. So um, you can see you can see that this is definitely a common theme in um, in the uh, oceanic ecoacoustics research. And one further aspect of the uh, research in the ocean that I'd like to develop a bit is uh, how sophisticated the uh, sound propagation modeling has become. It's because it's well known that sounds in the water um, reach very far and transmit very fast in water. So you can hear some sounds, depending on many, fact on, on many factors, of course, over kilometers away. And it's not like... Um, the classical textbook example that a point source in the water would just have spherical spreading and you can expect uh, fairly well how loud that sound is going to be at what distance. No, it's much more complicated than that. And that's why there's a, there's a large um, uh, uh, part of research uh, that deals with these uh, sound transmission aspects because trans sound transmission depends on many things such as the currents the temperature of the water, the topology, and the salinity. And these are just the environmental factors that play a role. And what you can see here, for instance, on the right, is how a specific uh, sound source, this is now based on modeling, can actually even, the, the, the energy can be trapped in a duct close to the, to the shallow, to the, to the surface and travel very far. And you can see that some of these sound waves have definitely uh, patterns that you wouldn't expect. And, um, some of these these models or 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 simulations are uh, are very useful because they can be combined together with calibrated uh, calibrated measurements and calibrated recordings from from underwater deployments to even generate uh, maps global maps of ship noise of how uh, maritime traffic is impacting um, is is impacting different areas of the ocean in terms of uh, noise pollution and such such a synthesis a global synthesis uh, is actually unheard of uh, when you talk of the uh, uh, when you when you think of the terrestrial realm research, and that's where we're getting to the research that is done um, on land. That's also my background because I started with birds, uh, like many of us, and uh, and we also worked with uh, with the bats, Indian neurons, and also the primates. Uh, more and more, the focus, uh, the taxonomic focus, in in my case, actually broadened. Until it wasn't really the focus anymore, since now I'm dealing with soundscapes in general. But uh, still, um, this has been reviewed very nicely by uh, uh, Larissa Sugai and colleagues, and I think Larissa is in the is in the group today. I saw her, and uh, it emerged quite clearly uh, from her review and also from other review works that there is a very strong taxonomic focus when it comes to acoustic research on land. Um, specific people who are specialized on specific taxa, such as, let's take the classical example of bats and birds, buy specific recorders that might even be different and record with different settings and at different times of the day to get an idea of their target organisms. And even though a lot of research is, uh, is being done on land, uh, a lot of this is really uh, taxonomically uh, specialized. Uh, luckily, um, more recently, there have been um, developments that have encouraged a more holistic approach because since the Audiomoth became available, and this is what you see here at the bottom, the Audiomoth is a recorder that you can just get for 50 euros. So that's, that's bare bones without the batteries or anything. But that's, that's considerably cheaper than all of the other commercial alternatives uh, that you have out there. Which, And, and that gives you a recorder that actually... Um, that you can actually use for full spectrum recordings, meaning that by choosing a high sampling frequency, you can actually cover such a large frequency range that you can cover all of the respective taxa. So we're seeing a direction, uh, a shift here also uh, towards less and less specialized uh, recordings, in my opinion. Um, this, is, this is the direction that we're taking, and this is aided by technological developments. And overall, we could say that on land, this is definitely the, the biome that is most easily surveyed uh, acoustically. So, because, because these are so cheap and they're so easy to set up, sometimes it even leads to problems because all kinds of, um, of people uh, decide to, to go that way and to just buy 
like hundreds of audio maps and put them out in the landscape that sometimes the, the preparation is is a, a bit suffering uh, from that but that's another topic um the problem with um with much or the vast majority again of research on land is that the recordings that are generated are uncalibrated um, uh, compared to what happens in the ocean we have only relative uh, sound levels in these recordings we cannot really do serious noise uh, level um, measurements like is done in the ocean of course there are ways to calibrate uh, our instruments but uh, this is this is not uh, this is not part of the stranded protocol even though several people have um have recommended this another thing that um this is the most complicated slide i apologize um but it's going to be over soon the, the other thing that we um don't do so well on land maybe is something that i've um uh, personally uh, uh, did research about is to find out actually how large is the space that we are sampling with our sound recorders. It sounds like a seemingly simple question, but um, it's something that we just don't do at all. Um, on land, usually when you set up a recorder, you just set it up and you don't really wonder about how big is the area that we're actually sampling, which can sound a bit strange because everyone who was in a lab and who used a, a piece of equipment would uh, know that it's calibrated and would know the sensitivity and know, would know the specifications. But when it comes to recorders on land, we usually just don't know how large is this volume that we're sampling. And this has very strong implications for the, 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 all the measures that we derive from it, like the activity of the organisms, but also the richness, because richness increases with area. And so what we've done uh, back in the day in Indonesia was to measure just how uh, large these ranges, these acoustic ranges are. So what you can see here in the lower left is that we set up our recorder, it's symbolized here by this microphone at a specific point, and we emitted test sounds from different distances that were logarithmically increasing. And we looked at, uh, after analyzing the, the data, at how uh, how quickly, how steep is the slope of the uh, sound transmission? How fast does the sound level decline with distance until the point where this particular test sound here would reach the level of the ambient sound? And at this uh, at this intersection, we would define we would define it as the extinction distance, or you could also call it the range of the recorder. So basically, we used a field method for measuring just how far specific test sounds um, emitted in all kinds of conditions would reach. And then we discovered that um, the sound detection spaces, but it's, it's actually not very surprising since everything varies in ecology, but that the sound detection spaces are very variable from land use to land use. Uh, we saw large differences between forests and oil palm, which of course makes sense because they have a different vegetation structure. And moreover, a few years later, excellent work by uh, Oper and colleagues um, just published uh, last year, end of last year, showed how uh, by combining measurements in the field and also physics-based models, you could actually derive how these detection spaces, but they probably call it differently, uh, vary from, from month to month. Uh, so they did for the entire year. Both of these graphics are cropped, but you can see how for different, um, for different frequencies, and at different times of the day, how variable these detection ranges are. So this really complicates our task and uh, shows that we still have a lot of work to do, but we have the tools actually to be able to take into account uh, how large are the volumes that we're sampling. And um, on this complicated note, I'd like to end the part uh, that is about giving you just an, an overview of the, uh, the, the state of the research in those three different realms. Um, I, I said realms, but maybe uh, let me go back one slide. You, you saw that I used those symbols in the upper right. Um, this is for terrestrial, this is for marine, and this is for, for freshwater. We are following the framework of the global ecosystems typology. Um, which is based on a, on, a, on a nature paper that was published uh, just recently to, to categorize all of the ecosystems uh, in, in the world. And so these, these different realms, the main realms on, uh, on a global scale are 
the terrestrial realm, the marine realm, the freshwater realm, and there's another one that I will speak of uh, next. So this is what I mean when I talk about these realms. Um, so um, now that I've finished the, the overview part or the review part, I'd like to propose that um, since we're all here together and hopefully we're people that are not just working on land, but also people who are working in aquatic uh, systems, I'd like to propose that since we're using the same methods, we should actually make use of all of these uh, data that have been collected and, and have a holistic approach to soundscape ecology worldwide. So this is why I um, started this uh, Worldwide Soundscapes project. That's now one and a half years ago, um, back then when I was in China. Um, we collated metadata from all of the um, available soundscape data sets uh, that we could muster worldwide. We contacted people um, singly, individually, to, to get their metadata and to describe their data sets, to describe the data sets that comprised those soundscape recordings. To date, we have um, the bulk of our data sets are from the terrestrial realm, while we have a good number in the marine realm and a smaller number in the freshwater. These are only the validated data sets. It's actually, <laughs> some of you uh, are already in the project and uh, might wonder why, why this is not submitted yet, but it's actually a great deal of work to validate all of this. And um, so we're still at it, but we're almost finished. You can see um, from, from the different data that we gather about these data sets, um, you can see the time trends and how how these uh, the research has has kicked off and, and progressed to become more and more mainstream in these different realms. Um, oh, are we are missing the legend here. Well, okay, oh, no, actually, you can see it. The green one is the terrestrial. We have a trough here about the time that we had COVID, and we have a slight lag in uh, reporting the data from those projects that are already completed. And the nice thing about this uh, database that we're compiling is that um, we decided to only focus on um, soundscapes with uh, that fulfill specific criteria. So we only uh, consider passive recordings. So we're not taking into account uh, focal recordings at specific times of the day, maybe with a shotgun microphone, something very directional. And we're almost only considering recordings that are stationary so because we decided we don't want to complicate our lives and 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 that we want a clear assignment of what is happening in the soundscape to a clear point in space and the last point the more trickier one is that we are only uh, accepting uh, meta data sets from uh, replicated studies so we need to have at least some replication in space or in time meaning usually recordings over several days or recordings over several sites. And the good news is that actually most of our data sets are in the upper right box here where we have temporal and also spatial replication. Uh, while, while this here in the uh, lower left is would correspond to opportunistic recordings. And this is how we actually decided to distinguish our project uh, from other projects where uh, citizen scientists are involved. Uh, of course, uh, this is not to say that uh, non-replicated data sets don't have value. It's just a choice, a strategic choice that we made to be able to carry out our analysis. And um, I could also refer to the Silent uh, Cities uh, project, which is a citizen science project that uses soundscape gathered by, sci by citizen scientists uh, all over the world in different cities. And uh, this is also very exciting work, um, but different from what we're doing here. So you can visit the uh, Worldwide Soundscape Project page uh, here. Uh, I put the link. And the important thing is that all of the people who are contributing the metadata are invited as co-authors on the synthesis. And we're still open, and we will remain open even, even after publication of the synthesis, since this is, become, this is going to become part of my scientific project for which I'm going to finally have, um, um, how do you say? Uh, 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 yeah, a permanent job. So the project will remain open and we will develop it over the over the course of the next years. And welcome if you feel like you have interest and you have soundscape recordings that fit the criteria. So next, I'm going to show you some of the results from this project to give you an overview of what we think is happening uh, worldwide.
So the first one is rather simple. It's about the administrative coverage. Um, let me look at the time. Yeah, that should be okay. Um, you can see from these graphs where the research in administrative uh, terms has been has been co um, conducted. And even though there's a clear dominance of the of the UK for the freshwater realm, we don't have so many data sets there compared to the marine and the terrestrial realm. For the marine realm, we didn't uh, consider countries where are actually considered um, uh, sea regions as defined by the IHO, the International Hydrographic Organization. And what is striking in, in the results of the uh, marine and terrestrial realms is that the majority of the data actually come from regions that are not in the top 10. So these are these are stacked bars that are ordered by, by, um, by number of data sets. And it's always the others that uh, don't make it into the top 10, which are coming out. And it's actually encouraging because it shows how, how diverse uh, as a community we are. We are situated in different countries and we're also conducting research in many different uh, areas of the world. And it's, it's, it's like those di diversity histograms, right? There's a very long tail of, uh, of rare um, regions. And the other thing you can see from this graph is though, even though, though it hasn't been uh, specified always, um, there's also a strong um, focus on those protected areas. Yeah, we, we tend to like them a lot, but also because they hold so much bio, sorry, biodiversity. Um, I'm probably going to, to move this one here now. Oh, sorry. Oh, why is it? I shouldn't have touched anything. Ah, come on. Ah, escape works. Right. <laughs> now you saw the next slides, but this slide is about showing you the distribution of all of the sampling sites um, that are comprised within the Worldwide Soundscapes project within our database. We have more than 6,000 uh, sampling sites in the database. And um, we can show them here on the world map. Um, we can see with this heat map also how many sites are in a particular raster cell. And um, the nice thing is that we're basically conducting research all across the globe, which is which is really nice. Um, there's a lot of uh, marine and, and coastal um, recordings uh, that uh, you, you we're not quite sure whether it's terrestrial or marine because they're at this interface. Um, but basically, we have a pretty good coverage, but we also see very clearly that there are some 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 gaps. For instance, uh, we have nothing um, in Russia, and this was even before the war. Uh, it seems that there isn't such a an important tradition of ecoacoustic research in, in Russia. We also have uh, very clear gaps in the Sahara, in Central Asia, and um, at the North Pole. <laughs> Um, and, and when we when we look at the at the distribution uh, uh, of the sites of the sampling sites uh, with respect to the topography and the latitude, you can see that of course, since these are so challenging to to uh, attain, uh, we have very few also deep sea uh, sampling sites, and uh, you can also see from the map that the high sea is also seldom reached. And we can also see that apparently there seems to be technical or logistic uh, uh, limitations as we rarely reach above 2,000 meters, uh, meters above sea uh, level and, and none at all above 4,000 meters. So there are also important gaps uh, that we should address to have a, uh, to get a representative overview of uh, what's happening worldwide. And I'd like to also mention the IQOE database here, which is uh, focused on the marine data sets. Um, and we, you would see that there are similar trends and there's also some overlap between those uh, our databases. And they also include um, toad sensors, but um, uh, this is just to underline that there are similar efforts in, um, in single realms that are also undertaken. When it comes to the uh, distribution in time of these, these data sets, um, we can see 
uh, on this figure on the right, how how complete the different solar and lunar cycles are covered by the data sets. And again, here you see strong differences between the realms. For instance, when you take the marine realm in the middle, you can see when you uh, look at the, the pie charts with the more vivid colors in the center, you can see that usually the uh, marine data sets cover most of the uh, time windows of the, the dial cycle. So 89% here of the data sets uh, cover all of the, uh, the time windows during the 24 hour cycle. The lunar cycle is also very well covered and the seasonal cycle is mostly covered uh, over all seasons over most data sets. When you compare that to what's done on, the, uh, on land, you can see that, and this may also be due to this taxonomic specialization, to this focus that I mentioned before, that uh, actually not even the majority of data sets uh, manage to sample uh, most time windows um, uh, evenly. And also the lunar uh, cycle seems to be also just covered uh, randomly by chance uh, well enough, while the seasonal cycle is relatively poorly um, covered. And when we get to the last one, the freshwater realm, where uh, we have even less data sets, you can see that the situation uh, is even worse. So what we can say from that is that, um, and, and this is also, uh, this is also, that this makes sense, it's almost obvious. Um, when you put a recorder in the ocean, usually so many efforts are involved that you would run it for a long time. Big batteries are installed within these devices to run for a very long time. So you have very good temporal coverage in the marine uh, realm. On the, on the land, um, um, usually the recorders don't run for as long. And uh, sometimes there are also issues with theft or vandalism so that uh, we, we, don't, we don't cover all of the seasons and we also have uh, restrictions due to the temperature. But um, it's interesting to see that there, this specialization also trickles down to, the, uh, to how well we cover things in, uh, in the 24 hour cycle. I'll move this one up without, oh, right, ah, this worked. Now putting everything together, we wanted to have a, a measure of how intensively the sampling is done in all of these different ecosystems. And what I show you here in this figure are the four main realms as defined by the IUCN global ecosystem typology. We have the four main realms here. And the transitional realms, which are combinations of the main realm below, and they're ordered by area. And we can see for each realm just how intensive the, sam the sampling goes uh, as, as, as far as uh, space and time is considered. Actually, even though the marine realm is by far the largest, it has a relatively low number of sampling sites because it's just so, so difficult to, to deploy recorders in the water. But for each sampling site, we have a very high sampling intensity and time, as we would have on average 150, 75 days of sampling per site. The situation is reversed when you look at the land, because it's so easy to set up, set up recorders. So this is where we have the bulk of the sampling sites. We have 6,200 sites in, on land, uh, and each one of these on average is sampled only 22 days. On freshwater, we have relatively modest numbers uh, at the moment, because it's still taking off. But what um, here is, again, uh, striking is that the subterranean realm, which is um, which comprises any kind of uh, anthropogenic or natural void, is entirely, to our knowledge in our database, it's not represented. It's, it may be very, uh, very unsampled. So if any of you has uh, meta data sets or descriptions of your data sets from the subterranean realm, I mean, for instance, I can very well imagine that chiropterologists, there should be someone who at some point recorded soundscapes in caves, for instance, in bat caves, or someone who did uh, soundscape recordings in tunnels. These are, uh, even the anthropogenic ones are becoming very important habitats in our world. But at the moment, this is a very, this is a, a this is also a gaping void here. We have no data sets so far. And so it appears that um, the flagship ecosystems, such as the tropical forests and the coral reefs, they are relatively well studied. What is less well studied are the habitats that, of course, are challenging, such as the poles in the deserts on land. 
or the deep sea and surprisingly kelp and seagrass habitats but i'm still trying to find out whether this is a lack of uh, representation or uh, an actual result and um, on the freshwater realm we would have a uh, lower representation of small and dynamic bodies uh, water bodies And this here now is my last slide. Um, we actually concluded the uh, or in the in the manuscript that we're writing, um, we are uh, concluding the metadata analysis with case studies uh, by showcasing soundscapes from different ecosystems. And we also analyzed the recordings from these ecosystems to quantify just how much of the acoustic space is occupied by the different phonies, because we can use the phonies for a holistic approach to analyze all of these recordings from these different um, ecosystems. And so we had mountain ones, we had deep sea, we had polar ecosystems. Oh, I realized that the legend is missing. And we had tropical forests. But anyway, I'm going to show you now um, by clicking on the link and going to the respective demonstration collection, which is within the Worldwide Soundscape project. I have to move this one again. Oh. So this is here, the Worldwide Soundscape project that I um, that I talked to you about before. We host it on Ecosound Web, which is a, a website we've been developing over the past years for analyzing soundscapes. And um, it's interactive, so you can find out where in the world are different projects and um but we don't you can browse that yourself and um what i wanted to show you here to conclude is how different soundscapes uh, sound like so i'm going to zoom in and this is the demonstration collection which contains not only metadata but actually actual um soundscape recordings uh we're going to open this one and actually we're going to play a guessing game because you're going to tell me what it is that you're hearing um that's something else right so we just opened this soundscape off the coast of japan here and i'm going to play it back and we tested the sound before with ben so it should work so it's still done yeah so what is it that you hear and you might just you could just uh, say it out loud or write in the chat don't take too long, please. <laughs> it's because it stays the same. It's a relatively boring sound. I'm going to have a look at the chat. Where's the chat? I can't open the chat. Anyway, does anyone know what this is? Okay, I'm not going to wait too long. I'm just going to spill the beans. This is deep sea mining. This is the sound of the machinery that is being used to mine the deep sea. And this is a very important and upcoming activity that can be monitored acoustically and which is supposed to have very large detrimental effects on marine organisms. And now we can also go to something more pleasant. Um, and I will have a question for the terrestrial uh, ecologists uh, here. Um, because we're going to listen to, uh, let's say, this soundscape here. And you're going to please tell me what you think it is um, as soon as it finished loading. From the spectrogram, you might think, ah, oh, it's just noise, right? But uh, when you listen to it... <clears throat> So what is it that you heard? For for marine ecologists, it would be very easy to say that, but I think for terrestrial ones, it could be a revelation. Um, just just speak out, please. Well, sounds like okay. snapping shrimp. Yes, good one. I didn't. I don't know who said it, but yes, these are snapping shrimp, and snapping shrimp are amazingly. They, they can dominate entire soundscapes and you can find them all over the world. And this is, this is the kind of sound that they produce when they're present in very large aggregations in a coral reef, such as this one. It just occupies the entire soundscape, just like a broadband noise pattern. And now we can listen to something even more pleasant. Um, 
we could go to Indonesia and listen to some of my recordings or well, I wasn't alone, but um, we could open this one and this one would be from a tropical forest. And I think that it's going to be especially easy now to guess and you can just uh, say it out loud and we can just focus on some uh, by the way what you see here are the tags so this is how we analyzed um the recordings we we, we created tags we saved them and we exported them for analysis and um if we um if we focus let's say on this part which looks very messy but um amazingly complex and we listen to it please just tell me what you hear So who would dare to guess <clears throat> what is in there? Some of it quite easy. For instance, do you know what this part is? This is a very high pitched um, insect, probably a cicada. I'm not an insect expert. Klaus Riedel might be, uh, who is also online, might be able to tell us. Uh, probably more accurately what this is um you see the insects too high for me uh, which too which high oh right yeah which frequency is that um the upper one would be below 13 and 16 thousand hertz and yes, uh, the high. middle one I... five thousand to eight thousand yes yeah, i was too, distracted by the gibbons um yeah <laughs> yes but the gibbons down here a, a cicada, exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 that's where we heard them yeah. and we also have this whole frequency range here that is uh, dominated by different species of birds so you can see it's a it's a real real nice concert here and the last one is an enigma that i would like to show you if we still have time ben for one more and then it's the last slide Yes, and then I hope we have uh, some time for right. a few questions. Okay, this one's very short. That's my favorite. Um, so when you open this, let's let's drop the uh, dolphin whistles and listen to this part. Sounds kind of funny. So, does anyone know what this is? Wasn't me. <laughs> yes, it's it's underwater. It's it's the sound of the Mulloway fish. It sounds like a cow or something else you could think, but um, yeah, and this is how we close the loop because we started with the freshwater research while well, this is in between. And this is how we get to the last slide. Um, basically, I would like to tell you in the wrap up that we can use passive acoustic monitoring to track biodiversity and we, we can also listen to the human influences and monitor them and geophysical phenomena. And we've seen that PAM is used in all realms um, and at different stages of maturity, but, but that great work is being done everywhere and can, we can synthesize it and make use of it to get to know what the macroecological patterns are. For instance, we can analyze how, what is the basic relationship between humans and nature with a single method across ecosystems. And this is one of our next aims. And um, yeah, I just wanted to share my enthusiasm about the diversity of sounds of this planet and about what we can do with it in our research. And I, I hope um, that you liked it. And this is also the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, I just want to say, thank the, the colleagues of the project and the numerous co-authors, some of whom are, are here uh, today, but but that I just didn't have the time, uh, uh, not, not the time, but the space to list. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, many thanks, Kevin. So does anybody have a question or or comment for Kevin? I 
see one hand raised. Ashik. Hey, hey Kevin, uh, great presentation. Thanks for sharing um, a great body of work with Thanks. us uh, and so well distributed. Um, I have a couple of different questions. Uh, one is, you know, you were, use the word holistic in several locations. Um, hmm. You dive a little bit into it. What makes this work holistic and what you mean by holistic? Um, so that's my question one. And you had another angle to it is uh, kind of like bioacoustics to acoustics. Um, and in my experience of working with acoustics is that oftentimes, uh, you need a broad scale understanding of what's going on, but then what makes bioacoustics more really appealing or sound based science appealing is that the ability to kind of zoom in and out of the spaces to get greater understanding and meaning of data, because ultimately that gives you actionable research, in my personal opinion. Um, so do you see that as a, that dichotomy or do you see it as a continuum like bioacoustics and acoustics almost work together as mm -hmm. a complex so those Thanks. are my two initial mm -hmm. questions thank you ashik it's a very interesting one um maybe i have to roll a little bit back on the holistic one because there are several definitions and i may have used it too freely i i meant uh holistic in the sense that we can with one method and that would be passive acoustic monitoring monitor all the main ecosystems on earth which is in itself are uh, very unique i think and the other thing that makes it holistic is um is that we can not only monitor biodiversity but we can actually really get a good grasp of what humans are doing because most of our activities are actually kind of noisy um but maybe i might drop that word as uh, if you take it uh, very uh, exactly then 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 it's not exactly holistic but maybe i meant more like comprehensive um let's see no I no, no that was <laughs> that was not it that's not a critical feedback in that way no no that's fine I I understand more feedback. Yeah, yeah. And, and regarding your second question, I, I don't think it's a dichotomy between uh, bioacoustics and ecoacoustics. We definitely need both. And yes, sounds do offer us this amazing possibility to just zoom in and look at what is producing that particular sound under what conditions. What is this linked to the behavior? Is this communication or is it just a byproduct? Um, and so this is this is definitely amazing. And this is this is why this this is a mine, um, a gold mine of of, of of data that we find in these soundscapes. But to be able to write our synthesis, we deliberately chose to uh, work on a very, very basic, fundamental uh, and general level just by quantifying the um, acoustic space that was occupied by these, these different folies. This is not to say, of course, that we don't need bioacoustic uh, approaches. We do. And um, it's it's just not within the scope of, of our synthesis because there's so much ground to cover. And at some point you need to you need to set the, the boundaries. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I have four. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you so much. It's an excellent uh, work. Like it's amazing like to see uh, all these compilations. So I have like actually two questions. Um, one, when you were showing uh, one of the slides, um, and I don't remember the, the slide number, but you mentioned like validated soundscapes or something like that, uh, that they highlight like to be validated. So um, what do you mean with that? Like that was my first, like how um, how that validation is done. And second, how can we contribute our soundscapes to, to this? Because it sounds like a, an amazing thing like, to have. And I have like 20 sites here in central Massachusetts in forest that for like three years I've been recording and for many months. So I would love like to, to be able like to contribute some of this of this database with you. All right. Thanks. Thanks for the enthusiasm and the, and the compliment, Thor. Um, well, if you want to contribute, you can just uh, drop drop me a line, and I just put my address in in the chat. Uh, yes, we're open to anyone who has uh, data sets that fulfill the criteria. You can just uh, open the link that is there. Um, I can reshare that screen if you like, and um, explain how we validated the data sets. 
So you'll find all the information here, and uh, you're, you're, we're happy if you if you contact us, if you contact me, um, and we can discuss how to integrate your data. Um, how we validated the data sets? Well, usually we just contacted people, first people we knew, and then people who knew people who knew people who knew people. Um, and we asked them, so uh, we heard that you're working in this and that region, doing this and that on these and, these and those um, animals, and uh, would you be happy to share the metadata of your data sets? And usually what we get back is a pretty, um, uh, well, people have different systems for storing their data, for storing their metadata. Some don't have any system. And so we had to standardize this. We had to actually create a kind of, and I can show it to you uh, up there, uh, an online um, uh, basic database, uh, which is a Google Sheet that is freely available, uh, it's openly available, only with some parts locked, where you would enter your 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 details, general details about the data set. So here you see we had like 380 lines for the different collections. And you link those collections to sites. Uh, and these sites would have coordinates and a specific um, a specific ecosystem type. And you would de describe the, the deployments, when they started, when they ended, at what time you were recording and with what sampling frequency, all technical details. But the point is that um, we cannot do this, all of this for, for, for every single person. So most mostly the contributors had to enter the data themselves. And for some of these that were particularly tricky, which we had to lock like the deployment sheet here, we asked them to send the data separately so that we could control the input because we had very um, a, a very messy sheet uh, in, in, in the, back in the days. And after all the data would be there for the contributor, we would ask, uh, we would go through all of it and check: are the coordinates valid or do they display properly? And then um, at the very end, we would generate a link for those validate collections that we that anyone can then open to check. And then we would ask the, the collaborator, so are these really your sampling sites? Are they displayed properly or do, do they end up somewhere in the Indian Ocean? And what about your deployments? Do they show up fine on the timeline? Does it make sense? Or do you, did you record something in 2100, right? Which doesn't make any sense. And when all of these checks would have uh, completed, we would consider this is, uh, that this is a validated uh, data set. Wonderful, thank you so much. Welcome. Kevin, I'm wondering, this effort, the Worldwide Soundscapes Project, are you mainly looking to build this data set for this synthesis paper, or do you see this project mm -hmm. growing beyond that? Um, I imagine that it's a real, challenge to manage, but potentially like getting some system where, you know, people can um, enter their project metadata and we can learn about, you know, you know, create this global data set. I can see real use in that. So yes. um, mm -hmm. are you interested in both of those goals or mainly the, for the synthesis paper to characterize mm -hmm. um, patterns of research and coverage? Well, back when I was in China, I had I had um, I had to have understandably very clear publication goals. So back then, it was a means for writing an impactful uh, synthesis. Uh, luckily, now that I've secured a permanent position, um, and also before that, it's been decided that the value of this database goes beyond the synthesis. Uh, we originally actually wanted to analyze the soundscapes until we realized, oh, the metadata themselves have enough value to write some synthesis about them. And analyzing the soundscapes might be a much more arduous task that, than, than we thought. So it definitely is intended to go forward and to continue. Um, this is part of my research project, which um, I've been on the basis of which I've been I've been given this permanent position, and I intend to institutionalize it more and more. It's also integrated within European level uh, proposals of standardization, harmonization, and, and unifying European uh, monitoring um, efforts. So this is very much a long term goal. And as much as possible is also open source. I mean, the data themselves are open source. The website that you see here, it's all open source. And everyone who, who joins the project 
and and who had simply access to the data is welcome to write their own synthesis. Um, of course, uh, I'd like to have the honor to, to write the first one uh, with everyone on board, but um, and the second one is also uh, pretty much planned. But uh, this is meant to be like an, an inventory, a, a useful phone book where you could just open the world map and find whatever you need for your particular question and that you can then contact the people or maybe just download the recordings directly and, 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 and get started. So it's not something that is meant to be restricted to particular privileged people. Um, I really mean it. <laughs> it sounds a bit like I'm a salesman. Uh, but but yeah, it's, it's, it's here and it's free to use. Yeah, I think that's quite impactful. That will be really helpful for people who are looking to, I don't know, find training data for a project or find somebody who's working in a with yeah. similar questions, similar training systems. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm happy to hear that you're continuing this beyond just the the papers. Very much so. Does, does anybody else have any questions for Kevin Ashik? Sorry, I'm double dipping because it's very exciting. Um, <laughs> this question is about, you know, soundscape by definition, at least how I understand it, is dynamic. So let's say if you go out there and like, you know, every community around the world, you put a recorder and record for a month and bring it back. That's a snapshot of that month of that space. And if you go next month, it could be completely different uh, kind of a dynamics in the soundscape. So I love the ambition that you have. How do you kind of, what's your plans and thoughts about capturing that dynamism over time? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one question. And second one is like the data after, you know, I don't know what your data infrastructure looks like. You know, there's cost and infrastructural challenges that's associated with it. So people that are contributing data from different parts of the world what is a reasonable expectation that this will continue to be a resource for them over mm -hmm. time because it's their time resource and their natural history right yes maybe the second question first um this is also something that we talked about with klaus actually it's it's a major challenge but it's a technical one and a Mm, almost political one where do we store all of these data sustainably there it's big data we're we're talking about terabytes and terabytes and at the moment everything is still um stored in institutional servers um and and there's a few sites that are networking those different data sets um such as such as this one um my my and uh, the consortium i also work uh with and in are uh, aiming to institutionalize this uh for instance on a european level so that we can um so that uh, we get funding and that we get a system a system administrators who can manage this uh, platform and then make it available for uh, researchers or um, people who are eligible uh, to to upload their recordings on the website this is this is the long-term goal the, the, but the way this is currently handled is that um this website that you saw is, is stored on an institutional server <clears throat> which um because I'm associated with that research group and we have no particular restrictions on storage and uh, anyone who wants to uh, upload their soundscapes there and analyze them, we can also run, run BirdNet if you're fancy, um, can, can use it. And during upload, the uploader would specify which Creative Commons license um, to apply to that, to, to that recording. And you could also choose what kind of access you give to the collection of recordings, whether they're open, whether it's closed or only for members, who has what privileges. So this is all fine tunable. And it's because that the system is relatively advanced that um, if our European proposal gets through, that we would like to continue expanding it and, and making it available uh, for, for more people. Yeah, uh, thanks for, for, for your comment. And uh, the, the first one is... Um, uh, was about... dynamic soundscapes ah yeah, yeah yeah exactly so that's that's the next project so for the moment we're mainly doing the metadata synthesis but to capture the dynamics um and we're talking about dynamics not just in in, in time but also in space 
we intend to use the uh, global ecosystem typology framework to analyze each ecosystem. Uh, it's a categorization. There's going to be categories in a world that we know is a continuum of, of different things. Uh, but this is how we can uh, get, get a grip uh, on it. And um, we would then with very, I mean, it's, this hasn't been planned in detail, but we would establish a very, very systematic and, and rigorous design to sample things, maybe not like ecologists usually tend to do it by choosing sites, but maybe more at random or at least with a very strong systematic um, approach so that we can get representative statistical measures from each ecosystem from different regions with a sufficient sample size. And it's, it's when we realized that this analysis was very challenging that we decided to only do a metadata analysis also, because this is was, was this is what was originally planned. And then uh, we realized, oh, it's, it's actually kind of challenging. And of course, this uh, replication needs to be uh, continued in, um, in, in time. And this is why uh, we have this, um, this framework with the uh, with the solar, lunar, and seasonal cycles. Well, actually, the dial and the season are both solar cycles, and the lunar is is, is another one. But um, this kind of replication we intend to achieve within ecosystems and within regions. We would also like to have this replication within the different time windows in those different cycles, so that we can achieve representativeness. And we can also already see it from here in this graph. Actually, these different symbols correspond to different solar times. We had sunrise, noon, sunset, and night, depending on the direction of the arrow. And you can see that there's a lot of variation. So definitely, we're aware of it, but we cannot yet go into it. And we're going to to set this up properly. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. All right, well, thank you, Kevin, for this really amazing talk and this ambitious project. I have been paying attention to it for some time and it's really good to, to see where it is right now and that you have this new position and some institutional backing to continue growing it. So hopefully we can have you back in a year and um, learn about you know, how it's evolved and um, everybody in two weeks will be with Zuzana Brivalova and the Sound Forest Lab. So that should be another great presentation. And so thanks again, Kevin, and see everybody soon. Thanks for joining and for the invitation. Have a great day or night. All right, take care, everybody.